Hey everyone, I'm Ben Norton of Multipolarista, and this is the Empire and the Deep State series that I am co-hosting with friends of the show, Aaron Good and Seamus McGinnis of the American Exception podcast. This is part 10, and we're beginning to wrap up the theory section of the series, and, and we're going to go into more of a historical analysis. But before we get into the, the history and the deep history, we're going to do a final theoretical part here focused on the deep state. And, and once again, going back to this, this critical idea of what is the deep state, we really need to understand the theoretical dimensions of the deep state in order to be able to study and analyze the history of the U.S. deep state going forward and the U.S. empire. In the most recent parts, we talked about the weaknesses of academia, the failure of many mainstream academics to incorporate imperialism and state criminality into their analyses. We talked about the failure of different political science disciplines and historical disciplines. We talked about different models of power, the tripartite state, double government, different models of where power lies. We, we looked at C. Wright Mills, who was a left-wing sociologist who back in the 1950s articulated a very sophisticated critique of power. So those are all the, the parts that we've done leading up to now, this is going to be a more in-depth look at the deep state. And I think we're joined by one of probably the most qualified people on earth to study this. Aaron Good is himself a PhD, and he did his dissertation on the U.S. deep state. I think that really makes him probably one of the world's leading scholars on the U.S. deep state. So Aaron, let's get you know to the heart of the matter here. We talked about the shortcomings of the scholarship of other academics. So let's talk about dual state theory, double government theory, and the deep state. Right, and we've gone over, we've been going over this for for a while here, and talking about different ways of trying to conceptualize the sort of top down aspects of the what gets called the national security state, and how it ends up being not really a democratic, open, and uh, understood, debated. Uh, el governance element of governance in the United States. So we have got to figure out how to somehow come up with something more useful. So I talk a lot about Michael Glennon because he writes in political science, I believe he's at Tufts, and he wrote that book, uh, Double Government, you know, National Security and Double Government. And um, this, uh, he more or less makes a dual state argument where you have the democratic state or the, what he calls the Madisonian institutions, you know, after James Madison, and the um, Trumanite network, which is the national security state. And he, Glennon, to his credit, acknowledges the political vacuum that C. Wright Mills was talking about, the fact that these decisions about foreign policy and, and big questions are made not really in a democratic fashion. However, he attributes it to the organizational qualities of the national security state, of the Trumanite network, right? We called the Trumanite network because it was President Harry Truman who signed the 1947 National Security Act that created the CIA and the Joint Chiefs and the National Security Council and so on, sort of formed the basis of the Cold War national security state. So th that's why he calls them the Trumanites, now, the problem with Glennon is that he's better than pluralism or re generic political, liberal political science that actually takes it as an, an assumption that the U.S. is a democracy with pluralism and transparency and the rule of law. He actually points out how the legal system can't really check the national security state, the Congress can't, um, the president can't. You know that these guys have a lot of power, but he attribute he puts the power in the bureaucracies themselves, basically uh, collectively as a network of national security agencies, and he ignores, doesn't really add to his equation the power of the overworld of corporate wealth, and uh, he also fails to interrogate the origins of U.S. grand strategy in the first place, or really even what the general thrust of U.S. foreign policy is. So this is a problem for his um, book in that he doesn't give you the best rendering of what the U.S. empire is really about. He doesn't talk that much about empire and imperialism as a, as a concept, but you know that he's aware of these things just by how well read he is. So this, this to me seems like the kind of blinders that you put on yourself in academia when you know that there are things that are not 
really uh, when there are things that are anathema to the mainstream of the discipline and you want to be in the mainstream of the discipline. So he's it's good that he offers this valuable critique, but he only goes so far. He doesn't talk much about imperialism. He doesn't talk much about capitalism and how economic elites are really driving this, which is a problem because they are driving this. Um, the last thing I'll say about Glennon, which is to me very fascinating, was I heard an interview with him on, I believe it was the Who, What, Why podcast. And at the end, somebody asked him, like, what could possibly be done to kind of rein in this Trumanite network and bring it under more, make it more democratic and kind of democratize the national security state? And he said, well, you would really need like an RFK type of person to go after these people, you know, in reference to the way that like RFK went after the mafia in the United States, you know, organized crime syndicates and all that. And uh, I know that for him to see, he realizes, he has to realize that that is pregnant with implication for him to invoke RFK because we know that RFK was looking, we now know that he want, that he believed that the Trumanite network, you know, elements of the CIA and the, ma the military uh, were involved in his brother's assassination and he wanted to reinvestigate that as president and he wins the California primary. It looks like he's going to be able to go on to not get the nomination and he gets shot in the back of the head by a guy six feet in front of him okay and glennon cannot be unaware of this and yet there he is saying this and so i, I thought that was really telling uh, but those are the shortcomings of it it just doesn't look at imperialism or capitalism or what the u.s foreign policy really even is so how does mills's work we've spent the last few episodes talking about him but how does he write mills's work correct for some of those weaknesses well, and I, I think that we have said this, so I'm not going to go on at, at great length about about Mills and this aspect of it. But essentially, he puts the corporate rich as the as it being in the driver's seat of the power elite, the big three institutions of um, the political directorate, you know, politicians, uh, the democratic state, we could call it, and the warlords or you know the military elites. And then big business. So those are the three things. Glennon talks about double government, and it's two of those things. It's the politicians and it's the national security agencies, you know, uh, organizations in the government, Pentagon and intelligence and all that. So he leaves out the corporate rich, even though he quotes Mills in his book. So really Mills focusing on the corporate rich or what Peter Del Scott calls, calls the overworld of private wealth. This is uh, the key overdetermining factor and this is really what Glennon omits and what I really try to focus on and, and explain in American Exception. So, Aaron, those are different models that we have of the power structure in the United States. How does that inform your analysis of what the deep state is? Well, the issue with the deep state is and the overworld of private wealth, you know, corporate America, Wall Street, whatever you want to call it, the economic oligarchy of the United States, it wields influence over uh the state non-state entities and the double government you know the national security state and the po elected politicians so uh because they can, these these entities and forces can exert power over the over governance and history making they are essentially the deep state um in the past like in the 2015 article I wrote, I define the deep state as an obscure, dominant, supranational source of anti-democratic power. Okay, I would and I would add to that that the institutions that comprise the deep state are not all obscured. Some of them are out there, formally organized and transparent to varying degrees. Okay, like the Council on Foreign Relations, for example, or all of these think tanks, these neoconservative or liberal think tanks are they, they function in this way and they're kind of visible. You can see who works for them. Sometimes you can even see who funds them and so on. Um, and others are known to exist, but are pretty opaque. But then some things leak out about them. So like, and some of them are very secretive and, you know, troublesome to begin with, like the Safari Club created to be the CIA when the CIA was tied up because of Watergate, post-Watergate scandals, or the Bilderberg Group, which also, as I understand it, has connections to Marshall Fund uh, secret money. Uh, I think Peter Del Scott has described some of this, that like the builder, what the Bilderbergers were doing and this relationship between the Bilderbergers and American elites, um, ha had, there was a CIA connection there as well. It's a way to, to collaborate, to allow elites, capitalist elites in Western Europe and the United States to get together and, you know, network and form consensus on issues. 
The mainstream media has to be considered a part of the deep state. Its assumptions, its biases, its priorities, all of its defaults, these are uh, a function of a tiny elite of corporate wealth whose interest the media is going to serve uh, regardless of where that media outlet is on the corporate media spectrum okay so this is very this is pretty obvious today when you look at like MSNBC on the left uh, compared to like Fox and then you're, you're you're thinking gosh these guys are all they're all owned by the same entities and so they are they're they are not doing what the fourth estate is supposed to do in a society which is to like educate people so you have an informed public they manufacture consent and i think this case is way made very well by people like chomsky and parenti and others so this is this these all have to be considered part of the way we are governed in a top-down fashion now this idea of the deep state gets bastardized by donald trump uh in 2016 but it has a history that's much more fascinating and kind of overlooked these days uh, specifically in Turkey um, we can pull this up the term originally derives from Turkey where it described a closed network said to be more powerful than the public state the Turkish deep state availed itself of false flag terror orchestrated by the security apparatus with links to organized crime. It grew out of networks originally established by NATO's Operation Gladio in order to maintain stay behind paramilitary forces that could become an insurgency following a communist takeover. Okay, that's the Turkish version of it. And it got exposed. That's the, it's actually Turkish for deep state. It gets exposed after this uh, a wild fiasco uh, involving these characters and a car accident. And uh, Seamus, I think you did a little bit of uh, homework here to be able to uh, lay this out for people. So can you describe this event that exposed the Turkish deep state? Yeah, so this is this is really a hell of a story. I, I think it, it digs into a, a lot of important things. Um, so I'll try to keep this relatively brief. But um, when we talk about the term the deep state, I think it's it's been mentioned several times now across different media as as it sort of percolates in the public imagination um in, in a scholarly sense at least it gets brought up as originating in turkey um and if you're really you know nerdy you know about this surser look crash um because it was such a huge scandal in the 90s and it, it turns into this whole giant investigation that uncovers a dirty war um, and that's really the genesis of our understanding of a nexus between organized crime, intelligence, and then a public state. And we call that the deep state. But for people unfamiliar, it does also explore sort of the U.S.'s playbook abroad throughout the Cold War and then after, but also, uh, you know, represents exactly how wide reaching that network becomes. So as part of that, like you said, the, the sort of Cold War stay behind network strategy U.S. intelligence went around the world and, and essentially gave money and, in this case especially, materiel to Turkish right-wing death squads or paramilitary organizations. Primarily in Turkey, it was the, the Grey Wolves, who are essentially neo-Nazis who uh, either murdered or, quote-unquote, disappeared thousands of people over about 20, 30 years in Turkey. Now, Turkey, of course, is in a very central geographic spot. You have a connection between Western Europe so the Grey Wolves are sort of an extension of that NATO Gladio Western European operation uh, that is, is pretty well known, at, at least on these circles at this point. And then, of course, the Middle East, which no explanation why the U.S. has strategic interests there. I think that's been covered plenty. And then Central Asia, which I think, as we'll talk about a little later, Eurasia, Central Asia, Brzezinski wrote in, uh, in the 90s that whoever controlled that region controls the world. And that is very present on people's mind as they're trying to uh, gain a foothold. And Turkey acts as this sort of bridge, not just in terms of geopolitics, but in terms of, you know, very, on a base level, logistics. And by logistics, I mean moving heroin. So against that backdrop, in the middle of the Cold War, you need dark money or quote unquote hot money flowing uh, to fund these black ops. And Turkey's a good pivot point for that. So part of this story is that the Grey Wolves and the people who, you know, the bigger traffickers that they're representing are getting involved with the Italian mob. And so at one point, the Italian mob meets with the Turkish underworld 
which is this meeting between the Kapos and the Babas. Uh, and, and both groups are tied into the Gladio network. And they establish a new heroin route from the Middle East, from the, the Golden Crescent, to go through Turkey to Sicily. And it's sort of this new French connection. Uh, and in exchange for the heroin, they were paid in NATO arms. And they essentially would have their pick. So they would then sell those arms off to insurgent groups around the region or use them themselves uh, for political violence in Turkey. Um, those arms, again, were provided by the CIA and NATO. So essentially, you're giving these neo-Nazi Turks, uh, they could just go to these NATO stockpile locations and they'd get their picks. So they end up with everything from like Stinger missiles, tanks, you name it, they had their pick of it. And I would you know, say that's sort of reminiscent of things like in the 80s when suddenly there's like rocket launchers showing up in South Central LA. Those kinds of weapons don't just show up. They show up in places where intelligence cares about de destabilizing and about pouring a lot of money in and, and having political violence and just in general violence destabilize like you see with the years of lead in Italy, which are obviously intimately tied into all this. Um, but weapons are also provided by the BND, which is West German intelligence. So, of course, the Turks being neo-Nazis here, if you know anything about West German intelligence, that's just Nazis at that point. So, Yeah, the uh, BND was created by Reinhard Galen, who was the head of Nazi intelligence on the Eastern Front. And after, not even after World War II, toward the end of World War II, before Hitler killed himself, before the fall of the Third Reich, the CIA recruited Reinhard Galen to oversee its its the forthcoming Cold War. And then he created the Gellin organization under the CIA and then eventually the BND. And like you said, it was run by a bunch of former Nazis. So a lot of the people, especially this is much more uh, obvious or, or just sort of highness in, in, uh, in Italy, but in Italy and in Germany, sort of the Eastern Front part of it, or just in Italy in general, they would sort of just sweep up these gu these guys who were involved in intelligence or just, you know, war criminals in general and ship them off out of out of harm's way. Uh, obviously, that's part of, of paperclip, but even just saving people like Galen from from the Soviets, who obviously were uh, not thrilled that they <laughs> they couldn't kill him after all that. Um, and then, of course, lastly, getting back to the uh, the arms dealing here, they also were managing the weapons trafficking into the Grey Wolves uh, through a CIA front called Kintex. Now, one of the main heroin traffickers in the route here is called Abdullah Chatle, and he's sort of the main character here. He's a leader or sort of a deputy of the Grey Wolves. And during his time in the Grey Wolves, the political violence they created uh, which they were often able to pin on communists. That's the that's the the sort of false flag strategy here. It's the classic tactic all through the Cold War. Um, and, and false flags have a, a, a bad connotation now, and that's sort of a, a form of the uh, shit coding. I've been saying coding for a while. We found out from Ben Howard last night. It's it's coding, but we talked about that in part seven of sort of that. You know, we've been talking a lot about the way that conspiracies take on a different connotation, intentionally or not. Um, but this is where that originates and this is all, you know, very real and had a very real effect of destabilizing and decreasing public support and trust in the left because they would think a lot of this violence would come from them. And then later it could be proven in Italy, train bombings in Turkey, all kinds of political violence that could be, even if just in the moment you blame it, any sort of violence makes people more reactionary and it's going to make them sort of back off politically. And so it's too late, even if you investigate and you go, oh, it was actually the right it's too late. The The damage has been done and it makes people appeal to a state regardless. Yeah, Seamus, I, I, I don't want to interrupt your thought there, but just while on the subject of false flags, there was a recent political scandal in Colombia after the Colombian uh, attorney general's office admitted the so-called um, false positive scandal, which is false flags, but they say false positives in Spanish, in which the military forces backed by the U.S. and Colombia and under the far-right administration of Alvaro Uribe, who was a close ally of George Bush, close U.S. asset. He, he's also closely linked to drug cartels and death squads. And he ordered the military to murder thousands of civilians and then dress them up as guerrillas. And the Colombian attorney general's office admitted that 6,400 civilians were murdered by the Colombian state. And then blame they were falsely accused of being 
communist guerrillas to justify this this brutal war and to justify the billions of dollars that the U.S. sent through Plan Colombia. So that, that's a clear example of a false flag that was admitted by a government. And then, of course, we also have Operation Northwoods in which the U.S. government made plans to carry out terror attacks in Cuba and then blame them or terror attacks also in Florida and then blame them on the Cuban government. Yeah, and and uh, I mean, it's been it's it's a long running strategy. Even in in Vietnam, we would do massacres and then sort of turn around and be like, "Oh, it was the North Vietnamese." It wasn't. Yeah, it Operation wasn't. Phoenix in Vietnam. Exactly. So there's there's a long long history of that, and one of the the crazier stories here. Uh, people who look into John Paul the uh, first, there's a very weird story where he's pope for about a month. Uh, and then he starts looking into the finances around the Italian Gladio network. And then he just dies and no one asks any questions. But uh, I don't want to go too far afield on that. So uh, Chotle or, or Chotley, um ends up in Rome where he gave one of his underlings, Ali Agha. I'm sorry, I don't speak Turkish. I'm just sort of winging it with the names here. So no one, no one get mad at me. But he gave him a pistol, which then he, you know, that obviously there he's an accomplice to this more than anything but he even just hands him the pistol that ends up being used in the assassination attempt on john paul ii who's the pope for like non-catholics or something but um chotley ends up testifying in that case over the assassination attempt and basically says they were going to try and pin the assassination of the pope on the bulgarian secret service and on the kgb and they couldn't plant enough evidence they couldn't pull it off there are several similar cases to to that in uh, in Italy, but they can't end. They don't end up pulling it off, but they were trying to, and in other places and at other times, they very much did. And and again, that has a severe political effect because we think of oh, a couple thousand deaths now as as you know, especially after COVID, like and, and 9-11, It's like you think of it as you know this sort of. I don't know. I think we've been desensitized to political violence or what we perceive as sort of political violence because things like COVID were, were politicized. But um, at the time, I mean, it, like smaller populations and in Europe at this time, th the idea of thousands of people being murdered by these political groups is terrifying. It, it has a, a much more uh, uh, severe psychic effect on the population than maybe we can imagine as Americans in, in 2022 um, or just as Americans in general, honestly, because if you think about how much the 70s um, destabilized us without that level of, I mean, obviously intelligence was plenty busy here too, but without that level of destabilization, go ahead. Well, then. I mean, just look at the small number of attacks blamed on ISIS, like these shootings, like in Garland, Texas. And by the way, we know that the FBI provoked that, that an FBI uh, informant was involved directly and that he told Light the shooter- up, Texas. Yeah, light, yeah sh um, light up or shoot up Garland or shoot up Texas or whatever. So, I mean, just but look at the small handful of these shootings that were blamed on ISIS and not to downplay them. But, you know, how many people were killed? Like a small handful of people were killed in these shootings. And yet it was used to justify th this, you know, this crackdown, this kind of continuation of the never ending state of exception. Also in France, by the way, after the Bataclan massacre, which is also very shady, the French government used that to justify this kind of similar state of exception. So these are a small handful of these shootings and attacks in which a small handful of people died, but it was greatly, you know, dis disproportionately exaggerated. And just go back to the years of lead in which these were more frequent. And it's easy to see how this can, you, how these intelligence agencies can fuel a, a, a state of crisis. Exactly. And, and it has a, a right word ratchet effect, in, in, you know, in, in practice. So kind of, oh, I promised I'm getting back to Sursulik, guys. It, it's, it's happening. I, I'm getting there. So after all of that, after he flees uh, the Vatican and everything and gets out of there um, and, and testifies to get out and everything, uh, Chotley ends up arrested for drug smuggling in France and then in Switzerland. And he ends up in 1987 in a maximum security prison. And then, at least according to Sibel Edmonds, the strangest thing happens because while he's in prison, one night he just manages to get away because the doors to his cell open and uh, and suddenly a NATO helicopter just shows up 
and whisks him away and he disappears. And he is on Interpol's most wanted list. But in 1989, he shows up in England where even though, again, Interpol's looking out for him, he ends up with a British passport. And then in 1991, he arrives in my hometown, Chicago, and he marries an American. He gets a green card. Uh, and and is able to assume like six different false identities at any given time. And and for any of my like Fatula Gulen heads out there, like this is uh, this is sort of a prequel. But um, in Chicago, uh, then he ends up working for the CIA ex more explicitly now. I guess I mean he already was, but he's doing some very important work for them because he ends up destabilizing Azerbaijan, which is partially where we start using Al-Qaeda to do our dirty work and, and an ascendant bin Laden in the middle of that. And also in Kosovo, uh, which, he, you know, he was not there, but but it's a part of that sort of ongoing operation at the time. And then he also, I would add, spent some time in Xinjiang, China, uh, doing CIA destabiliz destabilization operations there too, inciting uh, Islamic um, radicalism and trying to incite terrorism. And obviously that has more than a historical rhyme at this point. It's a direct link to what, um, you know, for, I don't want to dig into the, the China stuff right now, but that is a, a, you know, sort of an early point where we're already around the edges, where we're already looking at the Chinese periphery and doing what we were doing to the Russians, which is try to destabilize their borders and cause these, the, the more extremist movements. And then once they, you know, quote unquote, have blowback, depends on the way you look at it, then suddenly they're the new enemy and it and it justifies after the cold war ends turning around and doing it all again but um we finally get back to turkey for decades the gray wolves had been doing shootings and bombings that have destabilized the country themselves it's sort of another years of lead like you were saying so on november 3rd uh 1996 we see that gladio actually made it out of the cold war it, it didn't it didn't just end when it's, it's supposed raison d'etre uh, you know, came to a close because Chotle and then his, if we can pull the slide back up. So because Chotle and then his gangster girlfriend, or who was also a model, and then a top police official were killed in a car accident on a remote highway near Suserluk, 100 miles southwest of Istanbul. And a Kurdish warlord who was in cahoots with Turkish security forces survived the crash. Um, and this is, I, I don't know how to sort of have an analog for our, our culture, but if you think of it as like, if, if, I don't know, Kagan, Supreme Court Justice Kagan, and then like Cara Delevingne, John Gotti, and then like Eric Adams just got in a car crash together <laughs> and we're like, we'd have some questions and, and they did. Mm -hmm. And so they go digging into it. And it turns out that it's a part of this story of essentially a dirty war against the Kurds that the, that the Turks were, were waging but it's also just this tiny piece of the larger Gladio operation. So if you imagine the ecosystem that has to come about for the police chiefs to be in league with, with the intelligence service, the MIT, which was created by the CIA, and then the you know whole organized crime network, and then the public state are all, you know, why, why else would they be meeting together? Why are they moving weapons together? Why are they allowing them to move heroin through, except that the 1980 military coup in Turkey was facilitated by the Grey Wolves. And so in exchange, they were allowed to keep, you know, moving heroin through. It depends, you know, how you see how much they care about drug trafficking like that. But essentially, that is the sort of confluence of interests at this point. And if you think about it that way, I, I mean, if you think about the little ecosystem that, you know, you see in the Turkish deep state, you have to multiply that out over every single country within the entire globe, like not just within the the proximity of the Cold War, but everywhere in Colombia, like we're talking about, happening again and again and again. And what it boils down to is a massive network that is funded by, created by, and weapons are provided by the U.S. and the U.S. deep state, and that sits at the epicenter. And so the Turkish deep state is just this tiny, tiny piece, but it it, it speaks to what we're talking about of a prolonged state of exception, because. Unlike, you know, you have the JFK assassination, you have Watergate, you have all these events happening that are making people distrust the government. The, the CIA's assassination programs are being exposed. But the thing that brought the concept of the deep state to the fore is just this car crash way out in Turkey. And, and that brings about this idea of that of that nexus. And, and it's a greater story of American organizations using the Cold War, 
as a pretext to do whatever they wanted, including using terrorist groups. And, and then once the USSR was dismantled, they needed a new enemy and, and it was dismantled. The, the USSR didn't just collapse. It was, it was an intentional move. And those exact same groups that were doing the destabilizing there could then be the new bad guys in the global war on terror. And uh, of course, like I said, the side story here of Xinjiang is, is not even a rhyme of history. So Aaron, I think you've called it the long cold war. At its core, it's just the exception at work or embodied. And it's a microcosm of it all. It's, it's geopolitics, it's intelligence, and then it's paramilitary fascists and drug dealers and local gangsters doing the dirty work and, and, and wreaking havoc on everyday people's lives. And that's the, the real cost of all this is the way that it manifests in political violence and in the lost hopes and dreams of, of, of many left movements that thought that this was the era that they could pull something off, that they could take power, that they could not turn their people into economic fodder. And the function that this had was, regardless of whether it was blamed on the left or the right, whether or not the false flags worked, it would always ratchet people to the right and make them distrust a, a collective action because there could be these these people among you at any point and that undermined so many political projects and had such a, a just a, a a detrimental effect on so many people's lives as a result of constructing this network that is the real cost of all this of of the exception being instituted country after country and that this is just one example but it it opened the door to something much much larger yeah this was um this kind of of networking within a state within a state first really to my knowledge identified by peter dale scott he wrote this essay in the 70s called parafascism and transnational repression something like that it eventually gets published in lobster and it's uh he's talking about he talks about the latelier assassination in washington which was done by operation condor people who were part of the chilean and brazilian and Argentine um, security services, right? That were like satellites of the CIA, but then they were working with drug dealers, et cetera, et cetera, just like the CIA has, but it's like sort of outsourced to the CIA. And then they eventually murder someone in the US. And so this kind of thing emerged, you know, you, the Susserlich thing is a dramatic uh, exposure of this, but if the US were interested in looking at these things, they got exposed in the US uh, earlier, they got, you know, in the 1970s, these things happened. And in the, in the aftermath of Watergate, lots of the intelligence investigations show these sort of similar things. But Gladio in Turkey is an example of well, what Peter Aaron, Scott I'm sorry called parafascism. Yeah, I'm sorry to cut you off, Aaron. I, I just wanted to really just put a, a pin in that idea um, or just emphasize that idea of the Letelier assassination because it's not that well known. I mean, this should be so scandalous. This is an example of these same kinds of gladio terror operations happening on U.S. soil. But Orlando Letelier was a, a major diplomat and an ally of um, Salvador Allende in Chile. And of course, everyone knows that in 1973, the CIA organized the coup to overthrow Allende. And then after that, the, the so-called DINA, the horrible you know, stas, um, SS-style secret police of Pinochet, would, would go and hunt Chilean diplomats and, and left-wing politicians around the world and murder them. And this was an example of one of these assassinations happening in Washington, D.C., like not On that Embassy far from Road. the White House. And not yeah. only was Orlando Leterrier murdered, but also there was a U.S. citizen who, who worked for a left-wing think tank, um, Ronnie Ron. Moffitt. Yeah, and she worked for the Institute for Policy Studies, the IPS, which still exists today. So this is an example of Gladio happening not only in Europe, but also in the U.S. Right. Yeah, on Embassy Row, it was, it was Sheraton, Sheraton Park where, where all that happened. And it, and it just, you know, right in the heart of it. I mean, I, I think in some way that's symbolic of like, we'll come get you anywhere, even even on our home turf, right in the right next to the White House. We don't care. Yeah, it later emerged that people like Bush and Kissinger, because Bush was CIA director at the time, that they were involved in somehow not allowing these cables to go through in a way that could have led to their like apprehension of these guys beforehand. The guy who carried it out, Michael Townley, was a was an American, was a white guy, and uh, he had some. I believe they were ex, you know, Cuban expat compatriots, because uh, that's what they did with the, the these sort of fascists from Cuba. They get deployed into like parafascism, these parafascist networks.
that like we saw emerge in Turkey in 1996. And uh, my, Michael Townley, it's funny, but he's that's the name that they give a guy in Grand Theft Auto, which I think is a callback to that. Grand Theft Auto V has a character named Michael Townley who is like, been worked as a government informant and as a as a low level organized crime person for a while so that had to have been a reference to that and additionally if you see the movie scarface there's kind of a uh, allusion to that where they're driving around and they're going to blow somebody up and tony montana actually is like he like realizes this is like too immoral even for him you know tony montana the biggest cocaine dealer fictitious of course that oliver stone you know he wrote that story but in scarface Tony Montana is like, no, I'm not doing this. <laughs> and then he shoots the guys uh, in the head, as I recall. Uh, so it's like Oliver Stone saying, like, even Tony Montana is like not as reprehensible as the guys that like run the CIA and the and the deep state and such. So this is, you know, the the parafascism or the anti-communist international. The U.S. puts that back together. Uh, the the anti-communist. International was the real name for the Axis powers, like the treaty that they signed. It was the Anti-Comintern Pact. And the U.S. reassembles these guys after uh, World War II, and they are used as assets in the Cold War to do just stuff like that they were involved in in Turkey and that they were involved in with the Letalier assassination uh, and all these coups that they stage all over the place. Uh, this is this is part of the deep state. And... Um, so this was it emerges in you know it could have emerged in the U.S. in the 70s, but those investigations were not very good. They were ultimately you know limited and compromised, and the CIA was able to stonewall, and the media really ultimately, even though they had been in sort of crusader mode because of Watergate, they do not really push forward on the issue of the intelligence agencies afterwards. They mostly act to limit them. They really hamstring the House Select Committee on Assassinations that was supposed to investigate JFK and RFK and MLK and did find that it was a conspiracy behind the JFK assassination in all probability. And also for the MLK one, they don't really do much on RFK, but they were trashed by the media. And uh, so nothing really, really comes of it. And then in the Susserlich thing happens in 1996. And it's really only known to people who follow these things very closely. It's not something that's talked about much in the United States. And so here you see like the power of, e even when these institutions can partially investigate some of these things and bring some of the facts to light, they run into a wall of state secrecy when it comes to uh, finding real accountability. And the media is uh, downplays the significance of these things. They also are not issues that you wanna study in academia or write about if you are trying to stay in the mainstream. And so they just exist there in the historical record as these things that just make you scratch your head. We and we, you know, we had recent incidents like this too. The Epstein thing is like that, where it's like it points to some dark fascistic element of the state, and there's really no plausible explanation for it that you could put in your head and allow you to like have these sort of liberal democratic ideas about what the US actually is. And yet there it is. But the the deep state becomes something. In an, it, that, that circulates enough in culture and, and society as we look around at events to where it, even, it starts to break into the mainstream. Now, I'm thinking of uh, in 2013, the New York Times actually wrote about it. You can put the slide up here. And uh, they said that uh, the New York Times 2013 asserted that deep state was an important new term and defined it as... New, new term. <laughs> yeah, right. A hard to perceive level of government or super control that exists regardless of elections and that may thwart popular movements or radical change. Some have said that Egypt is being manipulated by its deep state. So this was after the Arab Spring, you know, sweeps away the uh, Mubarak regime in who was a U.S. puppet. But then he, they, they, they end up electing a Muslim Brotherhood guy who has some policies that the Egyptian military or the U.S. that they disapprove of. And so there's another coup. And then the New York Times reply, re reports that Egypt, you know, maybe Egypt has a deep state. Who knows? Now, what really is the Egyptian deep state? Probably very similar to the Turkish deep state in that it's a, a crazy wall of corruption that, you know, behind which is probably probably the U.S. The CIA. Yeah. Also, this is this is a an object lesson in, in great journalism. Some have said that Egypt is being manipulated by its deep state. Some have said great journalism.
Some have said the New York Times is a propaganda mouthpiece for the U.S. government. I mean, at least in that case, because this is a common tactic of the corporate media is if there's something that they want to say, they'll use that kind of like, you know, way critics, to introduce it. Critics say some people say or people are saying. Or, yeah. But in this case, and it's usually to say something that they want to get out there that's kind of irritating and establishment friendly. Here, this one is like, at least they're getting at like, yeah, okay, Egypt has a deep state. <laughs> Although that's, you know, what really, they're never going to get at what that really is. Um, the next time that the deep state breaks into the mainstream is on uh, Bill Moyer's show. Uh, which is interesting because he was a guy who had a role in the cover-up of the JFK assassination. I, I don't think that he was a mastermind, but he was kind of a go-between uh, from people like Alsop and Rostow and Acheson uh, and Katzenberg, who was the assistant attorney general who was sort of taking over because RFK was kind of out of the picture for a little bit. Um, and so, so Moyers understands some of these things and he remembers these things pretty well and did some decent specials in the during Iran-Contra on all this. But he invites this guy, Mike Lofgren, on, who's a former, who's a Republican congressional staffer for a long time, and then he's written, writes this book, eventually called The Deep State. Or not, it was an article first. And he defines it in his book as a hybrid association of key elements of government and parts of top-level finance and industry that is effectively able to govern the United States with only limited reference to the consent of the governed as normally expressed through elections. And so this is an improvement. And he also says in his book that probably Wall Street is where the deep state's power ultimately resides. So this is more sophisticated than Glennon, and it's better than the New York Times versions, and it's applying it to the United States, which is also better than just looking at it as a Turkish phenomenon or looking at Gladio as something in Europe. Uh, this really gets more to the heart of the matter. But he does have an aversion to bigger issues of like state criminality. So he doesn't talk about these episodes in U.S. history like the Kennedy assassination uh, or 9-11 or, or, or the anthrax attacks or Epstein or, you know, uh, these other issues that are quite controversial and that many people see a deep state hand in. So it's like, but at least it's out there. That's, you know, happening, I think, around 2015 might be when his book came out. Um, but... Yeah, of course, this is, you know, this is before the term gets painted, but at least it was out there and it did exist and it had some historical work on it. But um, no, it, Lofgren does not approach the level of Peter Del Scott, unfortunately. And Peter Del Scott's work from the 70s on these issues is better than what Mike Lofgren was writing 40 years later. So you mentioned Peter Del Scott, uh, who on American Exception, there's an ongoing series kind of walking through his intellectual development. But I think we're going to only, you know, have so much time to, to quickly cover this, but how does his work eventually arrive at the idea of specifically a deep state? Well, I'll go ahead and pull up this uh, quote from him in 1972 that will uh, hopefully these will allow us to trace the evolution of his thinking here because he really tirelessly worked in these areas and uh, he, he informed a lot of my research, both in his like theoretical um, development and also the way that he laid out all these historical episodes. Um, he's really peerless in this area and uh, he, he has so many works in so many areas that you would look into and want to write about. It's, it's really astounding. And he began looking at, the, you know, the Vietnam War got him more active in, in politics and he, even though he had a political science uh, PhD, he actually taught in the English department at the University of California um, and he, as things happened with the Vietnam War and the drug traffic and the political assassinations of the 60s, uh, he placed more emphasis than others around him on the role of intelligence agencies. And in particular, the issue of parapolitics, which was a term that he coined. Parapolitics, as he defines it in The War Conspiracy, which came out in 1972 because they delayed it on purpose, uh, for different reasons. It's a fascinating story in and of itself. But parapolitics, he defines it as a system or practice of politics in which accountability is consciously diminished. And the significance of this is, you know, as we have been talking about, when the CIA is given the highest sanction from the government to carry out covert operations with plausible deniability, it, chain, it gives them the ability to manipulate politics in ways that democracy is not really equipped to handle, to where political events can happen that are politically impactful and that influence outcomes, but 
they're they're not understood. They're actually misunderstood by the public through the deliberate misdirection of the intelligence agencies that carry these things out with cover stories already planned and baked into them. And so we wouldn't even vote on policies. We can't talk about policies, honestly, if we don't know what they are, if we don't understand that Eisenhower made the decision to overthrow Iranian democracy and put in a dictator, then we can't vote whether we approve of this policy or not, whether we should reelect Eisenhower in 1956, uh, because we don't even know what his policies really are, because they come out and they lie about these things. To the media, you know, government spokespeople will say, oh, look, the people, there were uprisings in the street, and uh, it turns out that it was a great victory for democracy, and they overthrew Mossadegh, who was a bad leader. The same thing in Guatemala, and we don't know about it. So Peter Del Scott is looking at these issues uh, and, and saying this is important and we need to talk about this more. So this was kind of a narrow thing in, in a way focused more on covert operations because that's where accountability is consciously diminished as a matter of course, just in the way these things are planned. Now, this takes us to um, the, this, the next point I want to bring up, which I have here, the definition deep politics. So he stops talking just about parapolitics and he comes up with this idea of deep politics uh, in the 1980s. He comes up with this and he defines this as all those political practices and arrangements, deliberate or not, that are usually repressed in public discourse rather than acknowledged. And as examples of this, he talked about like the Chicago mob relationship in the, you know, for much, much of the 20th century where there were all these murders that were never, ever solved, like thousands of them. And that they were so intertwined with the governance system that like they were a part of the actual system of governance. And it was an accommodation between these forces, like the government, the economic elites and organized crime. And he was just calling this deep politics. He said all the, the, he says there's a whole realm of things. And so the, Chicago, the, mob, the, the efforts of organized crime throughout America would be a part of this. Uh, it grows, of course, after World War II with the syndicate and the, the National Wire Service and the Teamsters taking the Teamsters pension fund being used for mob purposes and so on and the CIA mafia relationships. These things metastasize and they get kind of brought into the state, you know, post World War II. But he calls these deep politics. And what he, he eventually gets to uh, with the, the book Deep Politics and, and the Death of JFK, he writes a book that really falsifies the low nut version of the, um, of the war that the Warren Commission puts out. It doesn't even really take this seriously. It's taken as a given, as I think all of us really should if you look at it. These things like the magic bullet are, are totally untenable. Um, and so Peter Dale Scott looks at, he, he doesn't spend a whole lot of time talking about like bullet trajectories and other things, but he wants to really get at the political system that could... Uh, manifest in such a way as to bring about this assassination and its cover-up for so long. So he calls, the, he defines this as a deep political system, and it's a system which habitually resorts to decision-making and enforcement procedures outside as well as inside those publicly sanctioned by law and society. So he's pointing to a duality of our system of governance or a duality of the state. He's saying that it's not that you don't have these uh, enforcement procedures and decision-making procedures that take place in publicly sanctioned venues, you know, like Congress, etc. Right. But it's that you also have things that are done in a, in a different way, in a different system, by a different logic, by a different set of actors. And you may not even know them, you know, we may not know what they are It's part of deep politics because it's usually repressed and not discussed. And this is the way that he evolved from just parapolitics to deep politics. And so he was writing about all of these things, and it's this kind of great, um, you know, synchronicity uh, with his own research and in the way things developed in, in Turkey and so on. Um, and so by the 2000s, Peter, has, Peter is aware of Susserlik and Turkey. I mean, he's been the top guy writing about these sort of things, right, that, that come to be understood as the deep state. But he doesn't really say America has a deep state in the same way that Turkey does, because he doesn't see it as being quite as institutionalized. He sees it more as a milieu uh, up to this point. But eventually in the 2000s, there's a conference that's uh, a, that's a symposium really, you know, on um, things related to parapolitics. And it's, uh, it brings in some academics. And one of them is the Swedish 
academic Ola Tanander, who's actually at the Peace Research Institute of Oslo, which is the one founded by Johan Galtung, pretty much the founder of peace studies as a discipline. And Ola Tanander, really brilliant guy. I've, we've exchanged a number of emails, he and Peter and I, and I have a long extended one that I draw from in the book and quote from because it's I thought it was so that like spectacular what he wrote. And we'll get to that in a later episode. But he wrote this essay or presented this paper at the conference, and Peter was there as well, Democratic State versus Deep State, Approaching the Dual State of the West. It's published in, I believe, 2009. It comes out in this, in this anthology, uh, edited by Eric Wilson, who's an Australian academic, Government of the Shadows, Parapolitics, and Criminal Sovereignty. And in this one, uh, he lays out the uh, existence of a deep state and he talks about it in relation to Gladio and he talks about it as being like actually sovereign and able to fine-tune democracy or add a veto power uh, to these to this deep state and uh, so this is uh, Peter and then Peter is persuaded uh, by Ola Tanander and he starts to talk about the deep state although it not he doesn't really flesh it out so much but he he mentions it in uh, the Road to 9-11, which is his magnum opus, uh, comes out in 2007, published by University of California. The only uh, book, on, the only critical book on 9-11 that I know of written uh, by a major university press. And uh, it's it's really outstanding. It's usually the book that I recommend to people that haven't read Peter Dale Scott before because it has a really great historical overview before you even get into uh, 9-11, and it, which in my own thinking on these issues was really heavily influenced by that. Like I've read the book a couple of times and I think I've listened to the audio book like two or three times and it's, uh, it, I always get something else out of it. So it's really, it's really brilliant. And, uh, that's where, that's where Peter started to write about this. It's actually a deep state. And he was talking about deep politics, but in Turkey, it emerges as Darren Devlet, which is deep state, but it really accords so perfectly with Peter's the, the deep politics and deep political system that he'd been talking about for years and years before, uh, and it matches it pretty perfectly. And so finally, he comes to the issue of the deep state, and he defines it more, although he's gone back and forth defining it, and uh, we, he and I have talked about this and exchanged a number of messages about this, and he elaborates on it in different ways. So this is not his one catch-all definition of the deep state. And uh, But he, here's one version of it. A milieu both inside and outside government with the power to steer the history of the public state and sometimes redirect it. Um, and in this end note, he also acknowledges that there are extra governmental structural components in the deep state system. So here you see him kind of this one. Actually, I said American War Machine, but I think this one might actually be in the American Deep State, which came out in 2015. And if you look at this, he's really. Uh, trying to hash it out in his own mind like a good scholar who's trying to grapple with some area that is not properly theorized. He's saying he, he's saying it's a milieu, okay, which which is to suggest it's not a structural component. But then he also points out in this footnote, well, there are some structural components to it. And so this, this I think, reflects not so much like uh, him contradicting himself as much as our inability to speak completely authoritatively about decision making in the higher circles when the organs of the state are uh, and the organs of decision making in the regime whatever you want to call it are obscured from us and so this is the deep state uh you know let's just think of it as whatever it is it's got the power to steer history in the public state and sometimes redirect it i think that that's a, that was a good way for him to try to uh, get at this idea of the deep state so if i can point out one example of a structural component of the deep state it would be the one that peter lays out in american war machine and this is going to involve some historical actors that we're going to get into in later chapters so i'm not going to go in, in depth about them but if you ever heard of adnan khashoggi and bcci which was like one of those cia banks adnan khashoggi was like an arms dealer uh and also in a sort of general purpose uh secret agent man for the for the CIA and the American deep state and the Saudi milieu of like oil companies and, and weapons makers and everything else was considered and, the richest man in the world. Yeah, he was also the uncle of Jamal Khashoggi, who was killed by Saudi Arabia. He was the guy working with Qatar, which was writing his articles at the Washington Post. Right. I mean, you could we could go on about Khashoggi. Queen wrote a song about him, about his yacht. I think Trump ended up buying that yacht. Yeah, Trump and, bought uh, it. It's, it's, he's just a you know he's kind of the, one of those deep state figures, but um, he when the 
when Watergate happened and the CIA kind of became, uh, con- they cracked down on the CIA and covert operations and dirty tricks for a little while. Richard Helms over there in Iran used people like Adnan Khashoggi uh, to set up BCCI and the Safari Club uh, and use this to carry out covert operations and do all the CIA dirty tricks that the CIA couldn't do because it was actually tied up by the public state. And this points to a deep state. Uh, deep state power because it's not at this point it's not even nestled bureaucratically in the central intelligence agency in any part of the actual american national security state so this this really uh it speaks to the deepness of the deep state but here's what peter dell scott wrote about this as part of a supranational deep state whose organic links to the cia may have helped consolidate it it is clear however that decisions taken at this level by the safari club and bcci were in no way guided by the political determinations of those elected to power in Washington and were instead expressly created to overcome restraints established by political decisions in Washington. So this is pointing to things that this that they were involved in. They were involved in different covert operations, but there's, they're suspected of being involved in more things, including the October Surprise operation, uh, you know, the, the stopping the release of the hostages that would have helped Jimmy Carter. A lot of those figures emerge there. Um, and this is an example of the deep state being here acting to control or dominate or subvert what the actual democratic state was supposed to do. And that's uh, an example of top down power. And it's an example of the deep state actually having structural components. So once we land at, at that conception of, of a deep state, what is the sort of the metaphor or the, uh, you know, it helps to sort of visualize or, or we were talking about a couple episodes, the idea of like a behemoth versus a uh, versus a leviathan and you get sort of this bestiology going. What's the metaphor or the best way to conceptualize the deep state? Well, there are a few ways that you could look at it. And as metaphors or symbols, they're never perfect, but they have their benefits. So. There's one here that I can show you in this illustration, uh, which you can't see now, but it's a submerged structure. Uh, If you're listening on the audio, you can't see it. Submerged like an iceberg. That's sort of how Lofgren describes it. And it's like this picture, which is um, by, uh, who is it? Willie the Kid, I think, is the rapper. And this is an album cover, right? And so this picture, this octopus here. Uh, underneath a an island with a castle on it of some kind represents like the visible part of the state. You could look at it as a metaphor like that, right? Okay, that's sort of the coolest picture I could find. And so this is one way you could think of it, but this is uh, this this is more complicated. This is kind of inadequate because it doesn't really deal with the way that it permeates more and more of society. It's just more of like a top secret part of the actual state. So there's problems with this metaphor. Peter Del Scott. Uh, describes it as more of a weather system, like something very powerful that can cover, you know, more, more area. Okay. In this case, covering the things like the democratically elected state, the national security state, the mass media, and so on. So a weather system is the, is the model that Peter prefers. And what I would posit is something related to that. Um, The way that I define it in American Exception, uh, And I take a few stabs at this. It's longer in the glossary. There's more that I write about it. But one way to say it's not overly long, uh, I write, misappropriated in the Trump era, the term herein refers to the various institutions that collectively exercise undemocratic power over state and society. Pluralistic to various degrees, the deep state is an outgrowth of the overworld of private wealth. It includes most notably the institutions that advance overworld interests through the nexuses connecting the overworld, the underworld, and the national security organizations that mediate between them. And in that vein, to put this into a, you know, something that you could potentially visualize, imagine the democratic state, okay? The public state that is like Congress, most, most embodied by, let's say Congress. And we all know that there's this national security state that emerges also as a source of power uh, in the United States and as part of our system of governance, okay, the, the FBI domestically, CIA internationally, and all, NSA, listening to everybody, all these things that are kind of top secretive and authoritarian in their general and hierarchical in their structure, okay? So those, those things exist, but the tripartite part of it, the deep state, is 
perhaps best uh, embodied or symbolized with the Wall Street bull, okay, that over that is over top of it all, okay, that when you look at the power, corporate power and how it's dominated Congress, you know, and that you know, with Citizens United, it gets sort of codified into, into the law of the land, that corporate power shall be given the right to influence and corporate money to influence democracy, you know, un, to an unlimited degree. Um, with campaign contributions and so on and not, and many other ways that corporate power can influence with lobbying, et cetera, et cetera. And we, we all know this, right? Uh, and in the Pentagon as well, the, the, you know, the military industrial complex, this relationship is also part of corporate America, the privately incorporated permanent war economy, enormous influence over the national security state. On top of the fact that CIA uh, was essentially planned by Wall Street lawyers and Wall Street elites, right? And to, what does it do in practice? It looks after their interests, okay? They try to, some third world leader tries to nationalize some valuable holdings of an American corporation. CIA comes in and overthrows them, puts in a dictator that will uh, let the country be looted, okay? This is uh, so uh, very obviously beneficial for corporate America. And it's not surprising when you understand that Wall Street created the CIA in the first place. The CIA uh, and, is, is capitalism's invisible army. That's right. That is, and that is the, the way to think about it. And that is why it doesn't matter how you reform the efforts of presidents to reform the CIA, you know, fire some of the bad guys, get a new director. Even Nixon tried to like get all the dirt on the CIA to, to think that that might save him, try to figure out, try to get them to give up the goods on the Kennedy assassination. They wouldn't give it to him. Uh, and even if you fire the, the right people and put your own guys in there, they, they persist. And I think that the clear explanation for why that is, is because they are, they're the real source of their power, the root of it is capitalism and corporate wealth. And that's who they really serve. And so you can hack away at the branches, but the root of it is capitalism. Yeah. And I think you, you kind of answered the question that I had, but just to, to wrap up here, we, we had a good metaphor to visualize how the deep state functions really as the institutional apparatus of the ruling class, the capitalist class that it uses to to circumvent and override democracy. So in that sense, do you see the deep state more as a system or a structure? Like what, what is the way that you, you would see how it's how it's codified in that way? Well, the main argument of my book is that it is uh, I'm talking about the regime, the state, you know, our system of governance. But I, I make the case that it is really a systemic thing and you don't have to change the, the diagram that much to encapsulate this. I would say, of course, you have democracy, the public state and you have the national security state and you have civil society, which is supposed to influence these things. OK, so that you're, in theory, people are going to become informed citizens and they're going to vote for to, you know, advance their own interests and you're going to have representative government and yada, yada. But civil society also is dominated by and heavily influenced by corporate America because deep political power neutralizes the ability of civil society institutions to act as a check against top down anti-democratic forces. So who owns the media? Who funds even the alternative media? Who funds the think tanks? Who endows the chairs at universities? Who funds the academic journals? And, um, you could go on here, but this is, this is, uh, it's more than just Gramscian hegemony operating in kind of a passive way. You're talking about people who strategize and whose role it is to, you know, create, to manage society in this way. And so it really is a systemic thing. This is a, a systemic uh, aspect of the way that we live. This is a systemic feature of, Amer of American society. This top-down uh, system, tripartite state system, or you could call it the deep state system, since it's really deep political power that dominates. And uh, this is, I think, what we have to think of. And this is what we have to consider, really, the target of our critiques is this kind of top-down power of oligarchy. Uh, and that's what we're talking about. I think that's a great note to end on. End on. Um, it's it's always a real pleasure to listen to Aaron, you know, analyze these these structures of top down power of how the ruling class organizes itself and uses these anti democratic means to manipulate society. As I said at the beginning of this episode, I mean, it's not hyperbole to say that Aaron is probably at least 
one of the leading scholars in the world on the U.S. deep state. Unfortunately, it's not very well uh, understood and it's not interrogated much by mainstream academics. So that's why I, I really find it to be a privilege to be co-hosting the series. This is the Empire and Deep State series, which is based on Aaron's book, American Exception, Empire and the Deep State. Aaron and Seamus are co-hosts of the American Exception podcast. You can support that at patreon.com slash American Exception. This is a co-production with Multipolarista, which you can find at patreon.com slash Multipolarista. And we're going to be continuing going forward with the series. There's still a lot more to cover. We're going through his lengthy book and we're almost done with the theoretical section. Soon we're going to get into the history. So definitely, you know, keep listening and uh, we'll be back soon. Thanks a lot.